Yeah, Dr. James, are you available? Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah Dr. Prabh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. Hi, Palab. Hi, Dr. James. Hi, hi. Hello, James. Yes. What yeah. first one? Jackson, I should call you. So, a very good afternoon, all of you. So, on behalf of Naipur Ahmedabad, I welcome all of you. We have two eminent speakers in the lecture series one, Emerging Trends in Neurological Disorders. The first speaker is Dr. Jackson James, and the second speaker is Dr. James Kim. So, first of all, we are going to listen from Dr. Jackson James, who is scientist F and associate dean at Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, which is an autonomous institute under Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. So a brief introduction to Dr. James. So Dr. James had his PhD from CUSA, that is Cochin University of Science and Technology. And later he had his postdoctoral research in neural stem cell and transplantation biology. And then after he joined RGCV, and today he is scientist F and associated dean of academic affairs and PhD programs. And he is the team leader of stem cell research at RGCV. So talking about his honors, so Dr. James received the National Bioscience 2016 award, which is very prestigious from the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. And he's member of eminent scientific bodies, uh, eminent being the International Society for Stem Cell Research, you are United States, Society for Biotechnologists, India, Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, US, Society for Neurochemistry, India. So his publication list is too long to share. So without wasting more time, I would invite Dr. James to talk on Retinal Degeneration, Challenges in Mimicking Axon Guidance. Over to Dr. James. Thank you for the generous introduction, Dr. Prada. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, is it visible? Yes. Uh, okay, great. Okay, so thanks uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, oh, so this is uh, one of the program that we have in the lab and uh, I'll try to uh, explain about this program in addition to the other uh, programs that we have. So uh, coming to the retinal de uh, degeneration and challenges in mimicking axon guidance, uh, the challenge is like this, uh, as you know, this uh, uh, focus of this talk is uh, neural degeneration and uh, retina as you know is also a projection of the central nervous system with uh, all uh, seven type of neurons i mean six neurons and one type of glia and these neurons are actually modified neurons which do specific functions dr jackson sorry for the interruption can you yeah. just make the screen full screen please uh, i am in full screen okay one second one second uh, what about now? The screens, the slides are moving, but it's not full screen. It's not full screen. Okay, okay, okay. That, I always have this problem with Zoom. One second. Uh, let me just give me a moment. I'll come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you can do is you can share your full desktop. That way it will cover the. Okay, 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 okay. Can I do that? How about now? Yes, it's working now. Thank so you. now it's full screen, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. So uh, this uh, se se six type of uh, neurons, uh, they actually degenerate. And the, uh, when you do a transplantation to correct uh, any kind of neuron, the difference between uh, transplanting neural cells and uh, other cells is that the neurons actually need to very specifically form a circuit, like you have electrical circuits, each neuron has to connect to a specific neuron to do a proper function. 
So like nature has already designed during development in such a way that if a photoreceptor has to connect, it is going to connect to a bipolar cell and then connect to a retinal ganglion cell and they then take the signals to the brain visual centers. And th that is very beautifully done by nature. And now once it starts regenerating, now you put something, a new neuron, I, and ask it to connect to the brain visual centers, that is not going to happen very nicely, like nature has done it. Because the, during development, what has happened, there is no the cues or environment that is required for the proper connection of which neuron to which and how it should uh, transmit the signal is very difficult. And that is the challenge actually that we have, even in the when we talk about spinal cord injury or uh, any of these uh, neural issues uh, where the cells or the neurons that you put it in is not going to connect the way it was connected. So that is the main challenge. And we, we actually uh, tried transplanting cells in glaucoma and uh, we uh, tried many things and, and many, many people are trying this. And the challenge uh, now what we have faced is that we, uh, we or others, we are not able to actually connect a proper, make a proper connection to the brain visual centers in adult so that the cells that you put it in is actually going to do the function. So uh, if you have to understand that and try to mimic the condition in an adult, you need to understand the development. So that's what we do now. We have gone back to development and try to understand what are the materials that are required to form the proper connection, the axonal guidance, and then probably we could mimic that in the adult disease condition or a neurodegenerative conditions. So I will uh, introduce you first to glaucoma, and then we will go ahead uh, with what we do. So uh, this, uh, I, I'm sure you are all familiar with the structure of the eye. So this is the uh, eye and this is the retina. And the retina always has the retinal ganglion cells phased inwards and the photoreceptors uh, phasing outward. And if you look in a detailed structure, you have cons, roads, and which are connected to uh, bipolar cells, and then connected, these in turn connect to the retinal ganglion cell and the long axons of the retinal ganglion cell take, take the signals all the way to the brain visual centers, very nicely. And these are all specialized neurons doing one specific function. And uh, if you look at development, uh, and uh, is my uh, mouse moving? You can see my mouse, right? My cursor? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, that's that's fine. So I can point. So uh, if you see the development days, embryonic day 10 to uh, postnatal day zero, there are different, uh, I mean, uh, different BHLH factors which are coming up and going. And when they come up, those specific factors actually induce a specific fate to the stem cells to make that kind of neuron. For example, when PAC6 and MATH5 come initially, they differentiate into RGCs, retinal ganglion cells. And and same seven type of neurons, and then uh, form the whole retina. So what happens? In a degeneration in the retina, there can be multiple degenerations. Uh, rods and cons can degenerate. The retinal ganglion cells can degenerate. So in a condition where the retinal ganglion cells degenerate and loses its connection through the optic nerve, that condition is called glaucoma. So if you look at the patient, this is a normal person having a vision, and this is a uh, person with, a, with glaucoma, he would see something like a tunnel vision. And this is the main problem with glaucoma is that the person is not going to have much of a symptom at a very early stage. So you would not know what is whether you have glaucoma or not. And as it pro
हेलो हेलो वी कैन हियर यू हेलो नाउ कैन यू कैन हियर मी राइट आई थिंक आई लॉस्ट कनेक्शन हियर इन बिटवीन ओके या फाइन सो व्हेन द इंट्राओकुलर प्रेशर इंक्रीजेस इट्स गोइंग टू मेक द आरटीसीज रीजेनरेट एंड degeneration actually leads to complete blindness and uh, the treatment are many mainly the symptomatic and uh, once the vision is lost or the retinal ganglion cells are lost they are not going to come back or you cannot regenerate them because the retina itself lacks any stem cells which can regenerate the lost cell there is one type of glia called the muller glia which actually now we know that you can actually differentiate uh, rgcs or any kind of cells in vitro in the culture dish but not much we not much is known how we can differentiate or induce differentiation within the retina so actually you need to supplement from outside uh, uh the differentiated uh, cells you need to put it in to get or transplant those cells to actually replenish the lost retinal ganglion cells so this if you look at this figure this is something like a normal person sees and as glaucoma progresses this is early glaucoma and this is advanced glaucoma and this is extreme advanced so you it's completely like a tunnel vision and uh, after this it's not possible to actually bring back the vision that is lost so what causes it is in a normal person the intraocular pressure would be 18 to 21 mm of mercury and if it goes above 21 you have a high chance of getting glaucoma and the factors are many it's hereditary or you can environment factors there are a lot of factors mainly which induce the increase in intraocular pressure which causes the degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells and this is a major concern in india because uh, many of the time uh, many many people in india we don't go to the ophthalmologist many uh, too often so we we don't get ourselves screened or in, at the very, very early stage so once we start losing vision then we go to the uh, hospital and then at that time it's too late to actually reduce the uh, progression that has happened so how is currently how it is treated is like you have uh, laser surgeries with where a hole is made in the uh, what you call between the iris and the trabecular meshwork so if you have a increase in pressure the excess fluid is drained out to reduce the pressure that is one way and medications of course beta blockers prostaglandin analogs and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors there are a lot of medicines to actually reduce the intraocular pressure so all it does is reduce the pressure and prevent the remaining cells remaining retinal ganglion cells from degenerating so you are you are arresting or reducing the speed at which glaucoma pro progresses but once it is gone the only way to actually re, uh, bring it back is either you transplant the cells that has gone so what the question is that we were asking is can we generate the retinal ganglion cells from embryonic or ipsc cells and if we can generate then do this if we transplant these cells do this uh, rgc is uh, integrate into the retina upon transplantation and if it integrates that's the biggest challenge if it integrates can can they actually form proper connections to the brain visual centers here the main problem is it has to connect to two places one is it has to receive the signal from the photoreceptors which are connected to the bipolar cells which in turn connect to the rgcs and then the long axons of the rgcs has to grow through the optic nerve optic nerve and then reach the visual centers so it's 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 extremely challenging in the adult environment because there is no cues or factors required for all this to happen in this adult eye so that is the biggest problem so i'll just quickly run you through uh, what we have done earlier and what we do now to address this issue so one of my very early jr of jagada what she did was uh, she looked at uh, the way the retinal progenitors the stem cells start starts differentiating into different kind of cells so this is already known and you know which factors are required at what stage to induce what kind of cell the question was can you actually generate retinal ganglion cells in vitro in the culture so what she this uh, she formulated a condition where fibroblast growth factor or fgf2 which which is the main factor which induces expression of pax6 and other 
uh, RGC specific genes in addition to sonic hedgehog and also you need a non signaling as you know is a signal that maintains the stem cells you, so you need, need to actually shut down not signal and then activate the differentiation of the retinal ganglion cell so we formulated based on previous understanding we formulated a condition how we are going to what all we have to put and how we are going to induce the rgc differentiation and these are kind of markers that uh, rgc specific markers uh, that uh, we look for if it is a rgc and many of them are actually uh, present in the brain too but if you look at the retina as such they are very specific in the retina to specific kind of uh, neurons so then we went ahead and formulated a differentiation condition for embryonic stem cells where uh, it's a long process and uh, where we we expose during differentiation uh, the cells to fibroblast growth factor in addition to dapt which blocks the not signaling and then it differentiates into retinal ganglion like cells i would say retinal ganglion like cells because you really don't know whether they are actually functional or not so what we do is this is in a differentiation condition if you look at these cells they express islet and math5 and they also express map2 which is a neural marker and if you look at all the panel of markers for uh, rgcs they do express that and during differentiation they do express brn3 which is a main marker for uh, rgc differentiation so they do express rgc markers so we went ahead with that and uh, these cells actually we made a, a gfp expressing embryonic stem cell line and then differentiated that and then uh, injected about uh, around 1 million cells approximately 0.5 to 1 million cells into mouse retina into the vitreous this is normal normal mouse and when you inject that these cells the green cells which are gfp labeled they do integrate into the retina and they do integrate into the layer that where the rgcs are there because for some reason there is a the cells where the cells end up it, they end up differentiating into that specific cell types of that layer but still we don't know whether the proper connections are made so they do integrate now the next question was can we actually see if this uh, cells that integrate are able to uh, actually do a function are they function so another student uh, Divi, dr divya who is uh, she was a phd student and now she is a scientist at shrijitra in toronto what she did uh, she actually developed uh, i mean two models of glaucoma one is a nmda model where you inject nmda into the retina i do the mouse eye and after 5 to 7 days the rgcs degenerate and it appears like a glaucoma model and there is another model which is a preclinical model of glaucoma which is a dba 2j mouse which does have a uh, point mutation and by the day, time it reaches 6 to 8 months they have increased intraocular pressure and they mimic something like a glaucoma so there are two models so one is artificially generated with nmd and the other is uh, with age like you have in uh, human beings with age it develops glaucoma so what she did in this model is she injected nmda and then after injecting nmda she made a flat mount and when you look at the rgcs the number of rgcs which is marked by brn3a you look from the top this is a flat mount so you see the cells nucleus of the cells rgcs so there is a depletion in the number of rgcs uh, compared to the control that means you have started losing rgc so it mimics something like a glaucoma model now what you do is what she did was she did a test for seeing how much vision is lost so for looking at, for the mouse there are two main uh, exp behavioral experiment that is uh, used one is called optometry where you have four screens computer screens arranged in a square pattern and there is light and dark i mean lines which are there horizontal uh, vertical lines and this actually with a software this line starts moving within between all the four screens and the mouse is placed in in the middle now a normal mouse when when the then when this uh, uh, white and uh, that light and dark lines start moving in one direction 
and you start slowly increasing the speed, the mouse, which has a normal vision, would, would try to track these moving lines. And after definitely after a particular speed, they will lose the tracking. So they will be able to track it with a till a particular speed. They will be able to track as the line moves. So they will move the head around, and the software will start recording how uh, synchronously they, the head moves and uh, the pattern of uh, gratings are moving around the screen. So if you look at this, uh, this is a control, and this is a mouse before NMG injection. They did have almost similar kind of uh, optometric parameters. And after NMG injection, they start losing their vision. So they cannot actually follow the, uh, the gratings that are moving. They start losing it. Another very interesting behavioral experiment is a large light and dark box. It's a very simple experiment. Mouse being nocturnal, they always want to remain in a dark chamber. So if you have a mouse, if you have a mouse with it, which is having a normal vision, they will always try to spend the time in the dark chamber. And they will try to mi come minimum into the light chamber. So the same mouse, when you uh, expose to a uh, this uh, light dark box uh, experiment, they, they do have a reduced time in the light lighted region, whereas the mouse which had NMD injection started starts losing, uh, I mean, starts spending more time. It doesn't know, the, it cannot differentiate very well between the light and dark, so it starts randomly moving around between the chambers. So this is a couple of experiments that is used to actually measure the amount of vision that is... Hello? Yeah, amount of vision that is lost or recovered. This is something very simple way you could uh, actually study that. So again, looking at the vision forming regions in the brain, the superior colliculus and uh, uh, the other regions, you find that, uh, okay, this is the same mouse after you inject NMDA, you also inject cholera toxin, which is labeled with a green fluorocode. So what cholera toxin does is it, it, tra it traces the neurons axons to all the way to the brain visual centers. So when you take sections of this brain, you can actually uh, see the number of axons from the RDCs that is reaching the brain visual centers. So there is a significant reduction that you see when you inject uh, NMD. But non-vision forming centers in the brain, you don't see a very, you do see a reduction, but not a very significant. So now what happened is, okay. And also the circadial rhythm, there is not much change if you inject NMDA. There are other type of RGC called IP RGCs, which actually maintain the circadial rhythm. So those are not affected when you inject uh, NMDA. So, okay, this is again cell, so, uh, GFP expressing RGCs that were injected into the, ret into the retina of a NMDA injected mouse. So you see the RGCs very nicely with process. They integrate into the layer and express all the RGC specific markers. Now, next, what we, she wanted to see was, do they really recover the vision? So the same experiment. Now, you see that there is a, some degree of increase in the tracking movement, but not very significant. And there is also a reduction in the time spent in the light chamber. Although we see this two very nice recovery kind of thing, we could not actually see that uh, observe when you put cholera toxin, we could not actually observe a drastic increase in the axons that reach the brain visual centers. So what does it mean? It means that the cells that you put in, in actually did not form a very good connections with the brain visual centers. So why do you see this kind of recovery? Probably because you had injected a good amount of RGC-like cells, which could be secreting many factors to actually help or decrease the degeneration of the already existing RGCs. And probably it could have supported it. But we are very confident that they did not form a proper connections. And it is understood that you don't have the environment to actually form the proper connection. So that it is not going to happen very nicely. So this is where the whole challenge starts. So this is another experiment where the animal, uh, the cells were injected and animal was exposed to light for some time. And you see the C4, which is the immediate early gene, starts expressing. That means the cells, the photoreceptors, actually transmitted, received the light, transmitted through the bipolar cells, and 
the cells that you transplanted actually got integrated to the bipolar cells. So that's why you see an immediate early gene activation with light. So it has happened till that. So intra-retinally, all the connections are formed. But from the retina, do they form the connection to the brain? That's the biggest question. So that's where we are right now. And what we started doing is we went back to the development and started looking at whether we can understand how the connections during development is formed. And if we understand how the connections are formed, can we mimic the condition in the adult retina so that the cells that you transplant is able to actually form, I mean, grow the axons or connect the axons from the uh, bipolar cells and then grow the axons all the way through the optic nerve to the brain visual centers. So that's the ultimate aim that we have, but uh, we are right now studying the development. So what uh, we were looking for, so this is what happens intra-retinally and also in the optic nerve, how the axons actually go to all the, I mean, go all the way to the brain visual center. So this is the retina and the RGCs that are initially formed, there is a very neat axonal guidance process that is happening. And this is caused due to a attraction and repulsion through various factors like uh, robo, robos and slits, natrin. There are, there are a lot of, lot of factors which induce attraction as well as, as, well as repulsion of the axons that are newly formed. And these axons, actually each axon then bundled together and then form the optic nerve and then go to the visual centers. So the question is, what are the factors that we can mimic or what, what would be the factors that would be inducing the axon, newly forming axons to actually uh, bundle together and go to the optic nerve. So that was the question. So what we went back to development and started asking whether initial master genes that are required for fate specification, do they have any role in, in axonal guidance? Because one of the important gene that is PAC6, we found that during early development, FACSIS is, as I told you, very important for RGC fate specification. Now, if you look at this mouse model, which is called a PACSIS A mouse, this mouse, uh, the PACSIS is knocked out from the very early stage and the eye, eye does not develop. So heterozygous, there is a loss of development of one eye and one eye is quite normal. And homozygous is not going to survive. So you breed this animal between heterozygous and heterozygous and uh, Homo, there will be homozygous pups which you take uh, for your study and the adult you will see heterozygous you will see that one eye is completely lost so it's that important and it's very important for the development of brain too so the embryos don't uh, homozygous embryos don't survive so similarly uh, if you look at pac 6 expression at a very early stage of embryo that is embryonic day 40 embryonic day 16 embryonic day 18 at the early stage the the pac 6 expression starts and the retinal ganglion cells are also formed. Now, after by 18 to postnatal day zero, the retinal ganglion cell formation is stopped. But if you see the adult and later stages, you do see the expression of PAC6. So, as I told you, the PAC6 is required at early stage for pushing the fate towards retinal ganglion cell, but they do remain, the expression remains later on during development for some reason. So if you took the adult, there is expression of PAC6 in the retinal ganglion cells. So the question that we were asking is, what is this PAC6 doing? Does it have, after the cell is born, the retinal ganglion cell is born, does it have anything to do with axonal guidance or attracting the axons at a later stage or intra-retinal axonal guidance? Does it have a role? So one of the student, uh, PhD student, Lerda, who is currently in uh, a research scientist at iSTEM, which is a company in Bangalore, See, she started uh, looking at this phenomena and what she did was she injected siRNA into the retina uh, at embryonic day 16 when the retinal ganglion cells are being formed. She elproporated it and then took out the eyeball and then allowed, cultured this cell, uh, I mean the whole explant retina in culture. So when you put explant retina in culture, the only the axons of the RGC starts coming out. The other cells do not have this long axons, but the RGCs are very long axons, which starts coming out and forming very beautiful network. So this is a this is a, a, a piece of retina, which when you put it in culture, it forms like a clump. 
and the R RGCs alone, they start sending out long axons. So this is a normal one where you see very nice. If you see the blown up uh, image, you'll see that axons coming and there are axons which are bundling together. And if you uh, see the knockout, there is a minimum number of axons which bundle together. And you see a lot of free end axons. End, end of axons do not come together to form bundles. So this indicates that it has something to do with axonal guidance. Because once the after the phage is formed, when you knock out PAC6, the axonal guidance is lost in culture. This is in culture. So the next question that uh, we were asking is, if it is losing in culture, so can we mimic this in in vivo, in the animal? So she started doing a very beautiful experiment. Uh, we had a PAC6 flox mouse where uh, the exon 5 and 6 is actually flanked by the Loxby sites. And the ideal model would be a BRN3 cream mouse because only the RGCs, we could have knocked out uh, PAC6. But we did not have that model. So we, we had a Rosa Cree ERT2 mouse, Cree ERT2 mouse, which actually expresses uh, Cree in all the cells. So when you cross between these two animals, you get, uh, and be, it, this being a Cree ERT2, it will not uh, loop out as such if you have Cree ERT2, but you need to inject tamoxifen. At the time when you inject tamoxifen, the logs will loop out and the exon five and six of PAC6 will be knocked out. And when this is knocked out, the PAC6 protein becomes a mutated protein. So when we knock out this, we, we made the line, we crossed between this and collected the, the parent progeny. And this uh, Rosacri ERT2 PAC6 flox mouse was back crossed with PAC6 flox mouse. And then you get you inject tamoxifen at embryonic day 15 when the RGCs, the retinal ganglion cells, are just forming. So there are some retinal ganglion cells that are formed, but some have extended the axons. But when you knock out PAC6, what is going to happen is the next bunch of RGCs that are supposed to form will be lost. And also the RGCs that are already formed will probably lose their axonal guidance. So we, now, we injected tamoxifen at embryonic day 15, and you get this progeny where you have PAC6 knocked out at embryonic day 18. So at embryonic day 18, the pups were collected. And if you see the general, uh, I mean, morphology, you have a very thin, uh, compared to the control, thin ret thinner retina, so that there is a loss of cells. You do see loss of PAC6 compared to the controls. And very important is this observation. So this is a retina of a control, and this is a retina of a PAC6 knockout mouse, which is taken at embryonic day 18, where at embryonic day 16, 15, 16, the uh, tamoxifen was given. And this was stained with beta-3 tubulin so that all the axons are labeled. And then you look in a, through a confocal microscope from the top. This is a flat mount. So you make the retina flat, and then look through the top of the retina. So you're not taking sections. So when you look through a flat mount, in a normal, you will see that, that there is minimum of a single axons between the bundles. But if you see, look at the uh, knockout, there is the bundles are very thin, and they, they, you see a lot of network. If you look at the blown up image, you see a lot of free axon tips of RGCs that are losing their ability to bundle together. But if you look at this image, it has, it has formed a very thick axon, very thick uh, bundle of axons. And this is intra-retinal, within the retina. Now, from within the retina, they come all the way to the middle optic disc. And from the optic disc, they form the optic nerve to end, go to the visual centers. So we are looking right now only at the intra-retinal axonal guidance. So you see a lot of free axons. So this makes us conclude that when you lose PAC6 at a very of a, of a retinal ganglion cell that are just formed, and at the time when you know, when it is forming the uh, axons, you knock out PAC6, they will lose their bundling ability and they will also lose uh, the tracking to the existing axons. So they go here and there. So if you look at the binary image, it is still a little more clearer. 
So that is one very nice observation. Next, what we wanted to see was if PAC6, in addition to this, how is it doing? Is it actually controlling any of the axonal guidance molecules? So we, we don't know what is the, how this is happening. So what we did was between the knockout retina and the control retina, we did a whole uh, retina transcriptome analysis. So when we analyze this between uh, the control and PAC6, we came to uh, find very interesting group of genes that are altered. The main group of genes that were altered were the extracellular matrix, collagens, which, and as you know, if, if the axons, the newly formed axons, they have to grow to the optic nerve, they need to pass through a layer of extracellular matrix, which is just in the nerve fiber layer, which is a, where the act, all the axons of the RGCs come together and then pass through towards the optic disc to enter the optic nerve. So this region should have a proper extracellular matrix for these axons to float together, come together and bundle together. So when you knock out PAC6, this matrix is what is being altered. If you look a little more in depth, you would see that the retinal development is affected, the cell division is affected, and mainly the extracellular matrix molecules that are affected. And one of the important molecule that is, I mean, the factors that is affected is the collagens. So you have increased expression of collagen, which actually alters the composition of the extracellular matrix so that the axons cannot go the or, uh, track and go to the optic disc the way it was supposed to go. Yeah, Dr. Uh, James had a question. Hello. Dr. James has uh, raised his hand. I can answer that. Uh, Dr. Jackson, no, no, I, I accidentally pressed it. I'll ask you later. Okay, no problem, no problem. No problem, yeah. So the matrix is what we see is altered. Now, what we wanted to know is that globally, does PAC6 act, uh, I mean, can PAC6 regulate any other set of genes? So we did an in silico analysis of the, okay, these are some other uh, publications that also started where there where the collagens affect the axonal guidance. So there are many papers. And we, observing our observation, we, we were sure that we are on the right track where the axons are affected. I mean, the matrix is affected. So, okay, I, this is a, another beautiful experiment that uh, Lurda did to show that the extracellular matrix is very important. And that is what is affected when you knock out PAC6 at, at that particular stage. So. What we did was we have a green mouse, which is a GFP expressing mouse. So this GFP expressing mouse, every cell of this mouse will be expressing green fluorescent protein. So if you take the retina out, it will be green, it will be expressing GFP. And then what she did was she took a retina of green fluorescent mouse and the knockout mouse, and then co-cultured these together. So when you co-culture these together, you'll see that the GFP expressing cells, they form uh, the spell cell starts coming out, they start expanding, they start putting out their axons. And whereas the knockout in the culture doesn't attach at all to the culture dish. So what we did, uh, this is not purposely done, but accidentally there was a cow slip which we had put, which was partially put uh, sitting over the uh, one of the knockout retina. So it was actually pressing it down. Still, it was not the cells were not coming out as it was coming out in the GFP, uh, GFP retina. And when you put it together to the uh, uh, cells would actually come out and uh, process would come out very beautifully in the GFP mouse. This is sta GFP, uh, retina stained with beta 3 tubing. This is because this retina is able to secrete the matrix. There is a extracellular matrix being secreted, undefined matrix, which is being secreted out. But if you look at the knockout retina, which does not have a matrix that is being secreted, it doesn't attach. And the axons that are growing is actually growing within it. It is just interwinding, within, going within the retina in a lost space. It is not attaching to the dish or coming out into the, into the culture dish. 
and the same this is a, no, a control and this is a couple of other images of uh, pac6 knockout retina so this clearly shows that the extracellular matrix is the molecules uh, uh, matrix molecules are actually affected by knocking out pac6 so then what we did was we looked in silico whether there are uh, any other uh, sites for the pac6 to bind and interestingly one couple of axon guiding molecules that semaph uh, semaphorins and efferins we found a couple of them to have pac6 binding site and did a chip pcr which showed that they could really bind to it so this also confirms that they do have uh, influence on axon guiding molecules and they do have influence on pac6 does have influence on the extracellular matrix so this is what we concluded with this experiment that when you knock out pac this is a normal retina and you have the retinal ganglion cells that are formed and the axon starts coming out and there are efferin b1 receptors and they help uh, guide it properly and form the axon uh, through the uh, nerve fiber layer to form the axon bundles uh, uh, and if you knock out pac6 the complete process is gone the extracellular matrix is altered and it doesn't go to the point the optic disc where it was supposed to go so this was a very interesting finding which we published and uh, what currently uh, another P uh, phd student uh, budatte basu he actually is very interested in computation biology so he picks up all the large data that we have in the lab and starts analyzing it and what he did was this data that we have here this transcriptome data between a control and knockout he took this data and looked at all the axonal guidance genes that are differentially expressed and looked whether there is a splice variant circular rnas coming out from these axonal guidance genes so this was based on uh, the understanding that there are some circular rnas which can actually form small peptides which can translate because they some of them are known to have irs like elements and we had a hypothesis that if they actually localize in the axon growth form and if they, they these molecules are required for axon guidance attraction or repulsion they might actually translate at the growth form because that is where the emergency or a very fast requirement of what it is doing because the axon uh, growth cone actually moves like a amoeba it uh, moves around and then uh, goes to its target so what he did was he analyzed the whole thing and he found a number of circular rnas he did took two different softwares and uh, pulled out a number of circular rnas which were spliced out of the axonal guidance genes and he quickly did some experiments to actually prove that they are circular by using divergent primers and sequencing and because the junction where the uh, splicing happens it forms a loop like structure and uh, splices backward and then you have a new junction formed compared to the linear linear form and forms a circle so we could find that junction exactly from a pcr product that we sequenced and these were from axonal guidance genes like uh, neurologin and efferin 5 a5 f efferin a5 so currently what he is trying to see is whether with the hypothesis that these circular rnas some of them could be localized within the growth cone so that it could translate right there or it could do other functions of uh, sponging out micro rnas which actually control other axonal guidance genes so we don't know at this point but we are just trying to see whether these circular rnas do have a role because very interesting to uh, interesting note that uh, there are number of circular rnas actually coming out from the in the retina uh, come, uh, being formed in the retina and they are not actually uh, just noise repeatedly you find the same circular rnas coming up in in multiple uh, transcriptome data so the question was whether they are in the axon tip so he did a differential centrifugation to actually collect the axon tip and then did a pcr and saw that many of them are actually expressed in the axonal tip and he actually also did a very interesting experiment to pull down 
the circular RNAs that are actually translating by using a flex EGFP uh, system with a uh, POW uh, 4F is actually VRN3B running a CRE. So when you have these two AAV vectors uh, uh, and you transfect it into the retinal ganglion cells, this uh, GFP is an inverted position which is fused to uh, the ribosome. And when the in, in only in the RGCs, this uh, BRN3, I mean POW4F CRE will loop out and uh, it will form the GFP will be in the correct orientation. So it will be G, expressing GFP. And the, it is fused, since it is fused to a ribosome, only that it will attach to the translating uh, uh, linear as well as the circular RNA. And uh, you could actually pull, pull it out with the GFP antibody. So he did that. And interestingly, there are a lot of circular RNAs that are translating. So we are very excited about it. The uh, number of translating circular RNAs, and probably we are now looking at uh, what this translation at the growth cone would mean, whether it has something to do with axonal guidance. And uh, there is another very interesting system uh, to study uh, the axonal guidance, which is uh, published in stem cell reports. So what they have done is, and we are trying to mimic the system in our lab, what they have done is they have uh, made uh, retinal organoids and brain organoids from uh, iPSC cells. And what they do is you take one retinal organoid and keep it together with a brain organoid, and they call it assembloid. So from the retina, the axons will grow into the brain. So if you if the retina is having GF, uh, RFP expression, you can actually trace the RGCs growing into the brain organoid. So this becomes a very nice um, in vitro system to actually knock out uh, the circular RNAs or overexpressed circular RNAs to see what is happening to the axon guidance. So trying to mimic this in our lab and uh, that is where what we are right now and once we understand this process what uh, we would like to do is mimic this condition mimic the extracellular matrix composition in the adult retina and see whether we could actually guide the axons that we transplant in the adult retina and probably this could be also useful for uh, uh, spinal cord injuries because uh, there also the matrix would be something that is very important so uh, this is where we are, and uh, I'll stop here. So this is my team and uh, collaborators who have helped us. And uh, uh, there is Summer Hatter who helped with the initial experiments with uh, the uh, animal models and uh, with the NMDA and uh, the glaucoma model. So uh, actually, uh, Dibya had got a Fulbright Fellowship and she went to John Hopkins in his lab and did many of the experiments there. And uh, thanks for the funding, Indramura funding for RGC and uh, uh, Department of Biotechnology and uh, CERB and uh, Kerala State. So we had been, they have been funding us really good to get this things going. So thank you. I would uh, be happy to take questions at this moment. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. So it was a wonderful talk enlightening about the retinal regeneration. So the floor is open for question. Can you take two, three questions, Dr. Jackson? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah. Hello? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your exciting talk. I'm really interested in like pack six knockout. You have uh, like you have already facilities at your animal house or you have already procured them from like certain lab. No, we have this facility in our animal. Actually, this pack six knockout uh, uh, was given uh, given to us from TAFR Mumbai. So, but okay. we do have uh, we we breed it here. And we do have a very good collection of uh, transgenic models that we require for experiment uh, in RGC. And we do have uh, some of the models that we have generated here. Okay. So my one question is like, uh, I am also working with spinal cord injury. So uh, my, one of the challenges is that the newly formed neuron does not have a similar kind of neurotype. So do you have a similar problem with uh, RGCs or this kind of... Uh, Yes. Can you please repeat it? There was some kind of a disturbance. I couldn't. I couldn't follow you, Gustav. Yeah, 
Yeah, Dr. James. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, basically, yeah. my question is the newly formed neurons after degeneration. Does it have similar phenotype as the previously neurons or they have different phenotypes? The phenotype based on markers of the cells that we transplant yes. is almost same like a vocal ganglion cells. Now, the, okay. the, there, are, there are two things uh, that can happen. First is uh, we don't see a, I mean, uh, axons growing. The other thing is that uh, the environment of the glaucoma I could actually probably with time, if you don't reduce the intraocular pressure, the cells that you transplant could also degenerate. So that is also a possibility. So you need to transplant the cells and you also need to control the intraocular pressure or the factors that was causing an increase in intraocular pressure. So probably that cells won't survive for long if the pressure is too high. So it's really challenging. Like once it has to integrate, then it has to form the connections. Any other question, please? So thank you, Dr. Jackson, for your wonderful talk. We are highly obliged that you spared your time for all of our students. So hopefully we see you physically sometimes at Naipur Ahmedabad in future. So sure. thank you very much. Thank you. So I will, I will go to the next speaker now. So the next speaker is Dr. James Clement who is an associate professor at Neuroscience Unit, JNCSR. So James' career in neuroscience started as a JRF in Professor Upinder Bhalla's laboratory in NCBS. So he did his PhD in Professor Randall's lab and Professor Graham Coleridge as co-PI for PhD in neuroscience at University of Bristol, UK. He moved to Scripps Research Institute, Florida for a postdoc in Dr. Gavin's Rombok's laboratory where He's along with collaborators, pioneering work in SYNGAP-1 led to the understanding of the importance of the critical period of neuronal development and its link to intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. Since July 2013, his lab using electrophysiology, two photon imaging and molecular biochemical techniques that continues to study how mutations in genes encoding proteins necessary for synaptic function causing <clears throat> intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder using SYNGAP-1 at JNCSR in Bengaluru. So James, excellent friend of mine and we have shared many platforms together. So welcome James, thanks for your time. So we are really enthusiastic to listen to you. Over to James. Thank you very much, Professor Pala for the invitation. It's a pleasure again to this to discuss my work, uh, my lab work that has been published recently. <clears throat> and um, just one second, let me share the screen. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone present in the auditorium and who are joined online. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually. Last time I was there just before COVID and I was able to interact with some faculty and some students, um, but unfortunately that is not possible now, but hopefully next time I will be able to come there and uh, meet uh, fac faculty, staff and students. So today I'll be discussing about one of our recent findings based on which has pair uh, work. Um, we recently, we published it in November on, on, a, on a new compound that uh, we have identified to provide a better therapeutic option to treat autism spectrum disorder. So my lab is interested in understanding how a monogenic mutation might trigger neurodermal disorders like autism spectrum disorder or schizophrenia and how it is carried over in the other stages. And the other part of the lab is trying to understand how uh, from the basic therapeutics, can we move on to the translation angle by testing some of the uh, compounds that are currently available in JNCSR. So like uh, Professor Pallab mentioned, my lab uses electrophysiology to foreign imaging behavior and certain molecular uh, techniques to understand the, the impact of monogenic mutations on synaptic function and also in the neural development and non-neural cells, especially during development. So for us, every day when we wake up, we were able to comb and brush out
All right, hope I, you can hear me now. Right, so at, if you look at the baby of a brain, they might have the same number of neurons like an adult, but there are less number of connections. And that's one of the reasons why the only thing they do is sleep, cry, sleep, cry. And by the time we reach the three year or five years of age, there's a huge increase in the number of connections. That's why the children are very naughty and turn the house upside down because the brain is enabling them to, to form lots of connections and learn whatever possible that they could so that it will help them to survive in the um, adult stages. But still some of the connections are not completely mature and not, not completely strong. So that will lead to um, loss of memory. So that's the reason sometimes the kids forget what they learn in the previous day when they get angry with us, the next day they behave as if not, nothing has happened and be normal unlike um, most many adults. But by the time we reach the adolescent age, the connections that are repeatedly activated are strengthened while the connections that are not repeatedly activated are had a weak stimulation, they are lost. You can see here only two connections have become retained and much stronger in, in terms of shape compared to the childhood when they have four connections, but only one, only two are retained and two others are lost because two others that are lost could be very weak stimulation or not repeatedly activated. When we were kids or we can we tell the kids, our kids to repeatedly study something or repeatedly do something so that we remember. So the reason, the reason is that when we do things repeatedly, that leads to a stronger uh, connections. When we have a stronger connection, that will correlate with uh, long-term memory formation. And it may sound so simple, but this formation elimination and maintenance are regulated by hundreds of proteins present in the presynapse and as well as in the uh, postsynapse. My lab is interested in understanding the function of a protein called Syngap in autism spectrum disorder. The ones that are purple colored here are already implicated in autism spectrum disorder. If there is a mutation in any one of the genes encoding this particular protein, it can lead to various brain related disorders, including autism spectrum disorder. But the question is, if you have a mutation where it affects the function of the protein, how it might disrupt the brain development in children? Or the whole brain in, in human being does not develop at the same time. It pretty much takes 18 years. And even after 18 years, we still have the capability to learn many things new, uh, unlike uh, children where they can learn everything really fast, but as an adult, we take some time to learn. So if you look at this picture, this is the uh, trajectory of how different regions of the brain develop. And at birth, you can see less number of connections, but the first region to, to uh, really get activated properly are, are, are responsible for vision, hearing, and touch. And at, at that time, when they reach the peak level of activity, you can see there's a huge increase in the number of connections. But as time goes by, the number of connections are reduced, but much higher than at what was at birth. And whatever it was repeatedly activated, they are retained. But you can see that the capability for vision, hearing, and touch is completely comes to zero, unlike for language and higher cognition, which I'll explain in a, a minute. And by the time we reach one year of age, the region responsible for language, symbols, idea, social relationship, we kind of tend to know who is your pair, who are your parents, siblings, and how to share uh, food and other, other things in the house. They reach the peak level from the one year onwards, but, but then they decline, but they don't never come to zero. Whereas the higher cognition, such as learning ABCD and thinking strategies, mathematics, physics, chemistry, all those things are, are begin at three to four years of age. And that's the reason why we go to school when we are three to four years of age, age because that's the time the brain is ready. But, and then by the time we reach the age of adolescent, our brain, which is mainly in the prefrontal cortex, which is sitting right in the front of the brain, uh, our head, that is responsible for critical thinking, reflective thinking, considered response. For example, as a teenager, you know, if, if the parents ask us, why did you come late? You don't want to tell them that, um, uh, you, can, you don't want to tell them that uh, they are, you went to a movie or you were hang out with friends. So you try to, try to think about how to manage it with, a, with less um, issues. So somebody has raised a hand, any question? Right, so, so 
So this this process of critical thinking and everything happens by 12 years of age and it matures by 18 years of age. That's the reason we give people people get voters ID and driver's license when they're 18 years of age. And you can see that higher cognition and language does not come to uh, zero. The reason is we do live in different states, different countries, and we have to adapt to the culture. We do make mistakes. So we are, to, and then we also have to learn a new language. So we are still capable of learning a new language and adapt to the situation and survive and still learn new things. It's just that it's much slower compared to the children. So what the way it, the question, next question is how it might, how the mutation might affect this whole process of development in the childhood. What might be the implication of such mutation? So as I mentioned earlier, this is the normal trajectory of brain development. In terms of mutations implicated in audition, it can lead to hyperconnections or hyperconnections. People might think, yes, hyperconnection might be good, but it's actually not true. The brain requires optimal number of connections for it to perform properly. And the way it might affect the brain or behavior of a person is it will disrupt the information processing. It, it, you know, the thought process is not very clear. You're not able to understand the social situation. You're not able to understand and understand the question that was asked to you by your class teacher or your parents or anyone for that matter. The biggest challenge is how do we reverse this process? How do we reverse this process and help them to lead an independent life, make them understand what is the information given to them? So the major question is, can the phenotypes be corrected after a clinical period of development? That is still a challenge. Most of the drugs that fail in the clinical trials uh, is because they test the drug at this age, but not around between three years and 15 years. When it comes to clinical trials, most of them are tested at this age group and they don't work at all. But if you give them around this age, it works. So that's the reason why most of the clinical trials uh, fail. And it's very important to identify which compounds can work better at this time point and help them to learn new things, remember new things and understand what is happening uh, in, the, in the outside world and lead an independent life without much help from the parents or from the society. So that's, that's the main aim and that is still remains, remains a, a challenge for various uh, reasons. So as I mentioned, my lab works on um, SYNGAP, we use heterozygous SYNGAP mutation as a, a mouse model, which is proven to be a very good preclinical mouse model to study our spectrum disorder. Uh, briefly, my briefly, SYNGAP is downstream of NMDA receptors. NMDA receptors are blocked by magnesium ion, so glutamate cannot activate the NMDA receptors. And we have AMPA receptors. So when glutamate binds to AMPA receptors, it does allow the magnesium to be uh, released. And uh, that allows the calcium to enter. When calcium enters, it phosphorylates calcaneus too, and that also phosphorylates thin gap. So if you notice, under no activity, under basal condition, it is suppressing the RAS GTPS activity. When there is when the, when there is activity, or when we learn something new, that separation is done. It leads to RAS activity and more protein synthesis, new protein synthesis, and that allows AMPA receptors to be in, in, inserted. In, the, in, in conditions of mutation, under basal conditions, when there is no activity, there's already increased level of RAS. So it's, it's pretty much behave, mimicking as if there is an activity, which is not there at all. And that leads to the AMPA receptor insertion. And from patient studies, we, sorry, and from patient studies, we know that there is, uh, these are in the in, de novo recent mutations or frame shift mutations. There are roughly 800 children have been identified so far. And this number has increased tremendously in the last two years. And they are, all of them are character, characterized by moderate severe eye, uh, intellectual disability, severe language impairment, epilepsy, and on anxiety. We use, we know only about heterozygous mutation, but not the homozygous mutation, because from my studies, we know that the homozygous mutant mice die within a few days. So it's possible that the baby might be dying in a few months and we don't know whether they died because of natural process or because of the mutations in such as in, in the SYNGAP gene. And from patient studies, we, we know that they have different behavior issues. One of them is intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder. When we say severe behavior problems that include tantrum, affection to objects, not to people, and they also have very high pain, pain threshold, 
um, eating problems because the muscles co mus muscular coordination is not there between the motor cortex and the, and the muscles, sleeping problems because of um, epilepsy, hypotonia, ataxia, and orthopedic abnorm abnorm abnormalities. These uh, orthopedic abnormalities ha happen in a very extreme cases, but not true for uh, all of them. As I mentioned, the, one of the major challenges is to identify a drug that has a better therapeutic to treat the sexual disability in order to suspect and disorder. Currently available drugs, they target eating problems and the uh, sleeping problem, but not autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability. So it is, it, it, it's important to identify a compound that might help in restoring these to the basal level so that they can um, learn new things and importantly, lead an independent, independent life, life to an extent. So we, we through, through my, my studies and other studies, people have shown that these behavior issues are caused mainly due to altered uh, excitation and inhibition. So in this video, where we have done the voltage dye dependent studies, we will we activated single spine. And um, you can see that in the in the white tip, which is on the left, the activity is limited to that specific region and does not spread to other regions. So that tells the inhibition is working properly. And so it can is able to suppress unwanted excitation of pyramidal neurons or other excitatory uh, neurons, whereas in the heterozygous mutation, you can see that the, the activity sp spreads to the neighboring neurons, neighboring region of the hippocampus, and it is too intense, so the information cannot be processed properly, and it's going to disturb the person from, from learning anything new, and also to recollect the um, in new in information. So we asked if this is this dysregulated excitatory inhibition balance are due to GABA polarity switch during Development. So I quickly explain what is GABA polarity switch. People have people know that GABA is inhibitory during early stages of development. Sorry, um, inhibitory. But actually, in early stages of development, they are excitatory because you don't have ampere receptors and to activate NMDA. You well, need to. So you need to. Um, uh, you need to uh, use GABA to in order to activate NMDA uh, receptors. So what we what we mean by GABA being excitatory at the early stages of development is that the chloride concentration in the neuron is regulated by two chloride, chloride co-transporters, NKCC1 and KCC2. And what happens is when we have NKCC1, the chloride concentration level, chloride, it allows chloride to enter the cell at the basal, um, basal level. And when GABA neurons are activated and GABA binds to the GABA receptors, it allows the chloride to um, leave the cell and that leads leads to depolarization of the uh, neuron. Whereas by the time we reach the uh, end of the critical period or towards the time point where the brain is considered to be matured, these cases C2 becomes, they form oligomer, oligomers and without oligomerization, they cannot allow transport of chloride co-transporters. Uh, chloride, chloride ions inside the cell or remove the chloride, chloride ions from, from the cell. So no transportation occurs through cases C2 unless they form oligomers. So when, when the volumerization ha happens at the basal level, it removes the chloride from the neuron. So that makes the neuron more negative, And that also contributes towards this minus 70 millivolt testing membrane potential. And when GABA is activated, uh, GABA is, when GABA and receptors are activated, it allows chloride to enter the cell. And that leads to um, hyperpolarization of the, of the uh, neuron. And that way it will suppress the unwanted activities. And if any disruption, happens in the expression, expression of NKCC1 to KCC2, you can see that the activity is very high in the immature and the adult is much more balanced. And in disease conditions, if KCC2 is not functioning properly or NKCC1 is not functioning properly, it will lead to pathological conditions. And that might that is due to a, a imbalance between the excitatory and the uh, inhibitory um, neuron. So the question is, does this is observed in Syngap Mutation that might cause, cause that might also cause or contribute to the pathophysiology of autism and due to syngap mutation. From other models like Red syndrome, people have shown from I mean, studies have shown from the patients that the NKCC1 and KCC2 levels are altered. So as in fragile X uh, syndrome, where you can see the KCC2 is not affected, but NKCC1 is affected in the to, towards the end of the critical period. And when, we, when they did the astrophysiology to measure the chloride concentration with this reversal potential of chloride, that will in that it tell whether GABA is excitatory or inhibitory. You can see that in the black color one, which is the white type, the, it reaches the 
maturation it is the minus 70 millivolt around eight to nine days of age and that's a maturation time point for somatosensory cortex and in the mutant which is the gray gray filled one you can see that the uh, neurons reach the minus 70 millivolt one week later so fetalex mutation delays um, all the delays the whole process by at least a week and that's going to disturb how the information being processed and as i mentioned one of the challenges is to find the drug drug that actually works after the brain is considered to be developed which is the critical period of development and here when we looked at the when people have looked at the um, chloric concentration in the fragile x model um, the, this unfilled one is the kind of vehicle and the filled one is bimetonite. So bimetonite regulates NKCC1. As I mentioned earlier, you can see there's an increase in the NKCC1. So these authors are you know, tested whether by, by blocking the activity of NKCC1 by adding bimetonite, whether they can restore the function. Indeed, they were able to restore it. But if you see here, they, it, it is, it is, it, they were able to inject it during the developmental time point. But the challenge is what happens after the developmental time point, which is around P10. So when they gave it, sorry, I don't have the figure here, but when they gave it, they're not able to restore it. So when you give bumetanate after the critical period, it doesn't have any effect. So, so the point is that the drug has to be given during critical period. But the challenge is we need to find a drug that actually can help after the critical period of development, because when we take the kids for treatment, majority of the brain regions are already uh, ready and uh, it may be too late to help them so it's important to find the drug that actually works when we give the um, drug after the critical period of, of development so to understand whether we can use it as a therapeutic agent we have to find out whether these processes are affected in syngap mice and as i mentioned if the chloride concentration if this is the normal neuron where the resting membrane potential is around minus 70 if the chloride code transporters are not functioning properly you're going to see depolarized uh, neuron because chloride, chloride will be high inside and when the GABA binds it's going to be um, it's going to make the neuron more excitable so if the chloride co transport is not functioning it's going to shift shift it towards the more positive mem resting membrane um, potential and when we did those um, measurements where we looked at the reversal potential of chloride co chloride co -trons, um, chloride concentration inside the neuron that in that it tells whether in case in one is there or case 2 is there and whether GABA is excitatory or, or inhibitory, we my student which here recorded from P4 to 90 day old mice. And you can see here, the single mutant mice is, is still depolarized when the uh, wild type mice has attained the resting membrane potential. Again, it tells us that during developmental time point, GABA is still excitatory when it's supposed to become inhibitory. And that will have a huge tremendous consequences on how the neuronal neurons are formed how the connections are, are maintained. So um, as people have shown earlier, GABA, GABA changing, targeting the GABA polarity can be a potential therapeutic uh, targets. People have tried targeting SYNGAP, targeting SMR protein. Everything is a failure because you, they're not able to restore the behavior. You can restore the synaptic function. That will be, uh, be extremely um, irrelevant if we are not able to correct the a phenotype because when you talk to patients, they want to say how my child can sleep properly, how my child cannot have epileptic seizures. So it's important to show that the compound that we have actually corrects the phenotype. So before we started working on this, uh, um, a study from, um, uh, I forgot the name of the institute, sorry. So a study has shown that a bio compound can restore the chloride concentration inside the neuron. Here you can see, it, in the red syndrome uh, human IPSC model, the resting membrane potential is minus 50. Whereas when they added the bio compound, it is able to restore the um, membrane potential back to the wild type uh, level. So it, it was very promising and we already have a compound called 6-bio and we know from our earlier studies that it does cross the bedroom barrier and you can see that after 24 hours, it pretty much goes down. So we have to give 6-bio every day. So we designed a paradigm where we have to administer the drug according to three different groups. The first group is, do we need to inject this compound only during the critical period? So we chose the 16 time point because KCC2 expression changes. It's disrupted in syngap mutation at A14. And also from earlier studies, we know syngap mutation has a tremendous effect on P16, on six, 14 to 16 day old adult, uh, 16, 14 to 16 day old hippocampal um, mice. 
the maturation time point for hippocampus is 21 days and uh, gene and also the gene expression for of sim gap reaches maximum at uh, p, uh, 14 day to 16 day of age so we decided to inject for a few days before and go up to 16 days and do uh, behavior on 80th day and also measure ltp and choreco transporters at this age group and the second age age group is then is to understand whether you have to continuously give the compound from the early stages of development till the adulthood but the most challenging part and the most important part is to see if the compound works when we administer it right after the critical period or after the critical period is considered to be completed for example in the, since we used hippocampus region as a model the maturation time point is here and we all the behavior experiments pretty much involves the hippocampus we have we have given the compound from 30 day to 80 days and did the behavior experiments or electrophysiology experiments after the 80th day and this was not this was um, done along with collaboration collaboration with dr ravi manjitaya here in jnc who has who has a six bio compound and dr Sridhar rajaram he is an organic chemist in in jnc and dr kavita is our uh, uh, she was a postdoc in dr Sridhar um, rajaram who synthesized uh, tons of six bio compounds so as i mentioned earlier the Yeah, so as, as I mentioned earlier, um, we gave the compound from 30 day to 60 day. So I'm not going to talk about the early compound, uh, early age groups because of the time limit. I'm going to show only the important question that we asked is whether this compound can restore the phenotype and also the synaptic function when we administer it after the critical period. So this age is roughly around 10 years and plus in the humans and we used this behavior experiment um, to understand whether the phenotype can be corrected. And also we looked at the um, LTP. And um, yeah, so when we did the LTP experiments in the other stages, which was which is not, um, so this is in wild type, blue is wild type. You can see that LTP is very well induced and we did it in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And in Singac mutation, LTP is not possible at all. That has been shown by many other labs. And when we gave the wild type and and, and the six bio, you can see that it's not making, making huge difference compared to the kind of wild type vehicle. And when we gave this compound to the syngap mutant mice from 30 days to 80 days, you can see that the LTP is restored. So we asked the question that adult administration of six bio corrects LTP, and if it corrects LTP, can it reflect in the behavior? Remember what I said earlier, this scientific function is fine, but it has to reflect in skewing the behavior otherwise the compound will not be extremely useful and it will fail in the clinical trials so we did three major behavior experiments one of them is the open field um like uh, like patients they are high mouse can be hyperactive and if they they will run around close to the wall we will lift the, we will measure it for five minutes and see how much distance they cover and they tend to avoid going to the center because of anxiety level and and, and danger of uh, predators so they will try to avoid go to the go to the center very frequently. Whereas in the autistic mice models, we know that they do tend to go to the uh, center of the open field because they are less anx anxious. And the next experiment we did is the novel object recognition, where it has to discriminate, discriminate between the old object and the new object. Even that the autistic mice does not have memory, they will not be able to distinguish between the old my old object and the new object, and they tend to spend more time. Equally, whereas the wild tape mice will spend more time with a with a new object. It's like some new person coming to the lab. We will try, we'll be curious to know who they are, what they are, what they like, etc. And the third one is the social novel, novelty test. Um, these patients with autism prefer to spend more time with the objects than with the other persons. The preclinical mouse model behaves the same. They tend to spend more time with the objects rather than the mice. And again, they're not able to distinguish between the old mice and the and the new mice. Whenever we meet a new person anywhere, whether we go for a party or, or traveling, we tend to find out who they are, where they are from, what they do, um, and what they like, which, which sports they like, etc. So these mice tend to behave like uh, human patients and they prefer to be with the objects or they don't uh, want to interact with any mice. They sit in the center of center, in the center chamber. 
So when we did the open field, you can see that in the wild type vehicle, so blue is wild type vehicle, red is with the mutant vehicle. And you can see that the wild type runs around 2000 centimeters in five minutes, whereas the wild type, whereas the mutant mice tends to be hyperactive and covers a long distance. And the, when we give the six bio compound, they don't have much effect on the on the wild type, whereas the um, whereas the um, in the in the same gap six bio when administered mice, we were able to we were able to restore the uh, sorry we are not able to restore the um, motor function. They still are hyperactive when we administer it in the adult age age group. In terms of anxiety, you can see that in gap vehicle mice has a lot of um, anxiety, they enter the center of the chamber a lot. Whereas when we give the compound to these mutant mice, the anxiety was restored, especially when we administer it in the adult age groups. So anxiety was restored, but not the open field at this, not the locomotor activity at this specific um, age group. And when we tested them for social interaction and social difference, you can see that they're not able to distinguish between the empty jar and the stranger mice, whereas the wild type was able to uh, restore, they're able to distinguish, and the 6 bio does not affect much the wild type performance, um, whereas the 6 bio administered in gap mice were able to distinguish between the empty jar and the stranger one, and also they were able to spend more time with the a stranger one mice and the same for social preference that between two mice they were not able to able to um, they prefer not to spend time with the old with any of the mice whereas the skin gap administered mice was able to uh, spend time more time with the new mice so that means it prefers to it's able to understand not only understand the older mice and the new mice they're able to send, spend more time interacting with the mice, which, which they were not able to do it um, in the mutation without the compound. And the most important thing is, can we restore the memory? So we did discrimination, novel object discrimination. Here, the discrimination index is plotted. So anything 30 or below is considered as lack of uh, memory. Technically, it's 25, but for our purpose, we kept it as 30. So you can see that the syncap median mice now, was not able to distinguish between the old object and the new object. And when we gave the compound to the syncap muted mice, they were able to restore the uh, memory capabilities and the mice was able to distinguish between the old mice and the new mice. And the other common uh, issue seen in autistic patients is epileptic seizures. Here, when we given a floral tail, which induces epilepsy, you can see that in wild type, it takes a lot of time to, to show epileptic seizures, whereas thin gap mutant mice is able to display epileptic seizures at a much shorter time. That means the threshold is very, very low to induce epileptic seizures. And when we administer the compound to these mice, you can see that the epileptic seizures are almost back to the wild type level. It increases the threshold for epileptic seizures, and that delays the onset of uh, epileptic seizures in this thin gap mutant mice. So in summary, what we have done is we have evaluated the potent potency of these six bio in different age groups. The most challenging one is, is the young adolescent age group. And you can see that the, uh, open, the open field in the other earlier age groups, the motor function and anxiety was restored. Whereas when we gave it in 30 to 6, 80 day old, not 60, 80 day old, the motor function, correct, motor function was not corrected, but the anxiety was partially corrected. And the novel object recognition, that is the learning and memory capabilities are corrected irrespective of the age group. And same for social interaction. And this again, it same for uh, social preference. It was not corrected in P10 to 16. We believe that because though that region responsible for social preference may not have been ready. That means that they not even started the critical um, period, maybe between P16 to P20 or P30. So we might have missed the time point and that region might not be active at all at that time point in P10 to P16. And that's one reason why we are not seeing restoration in the social preference at this age group. And epilepsy, we couldn't do the early stages because of the ethical issues. But as I showed earlier, it was able to correct in the adult stages and functionally was also corrected. So as the uh, E-GABA, we didn't do it at this age group because in adults, we don't see a change in the chloric transporter 
expression. So, um, um, so this is a this is a new compound that we have identified that has a better option to treat uh, um, better therapeutics to treat autism spectrum disorder. Not only that, but it also a it has a potency to, to treat um, any of the neurodevelopmental dis disorders and also um, epilepsy. And not, none of this would be possible without the group. And majority of the work was pretty much ninety percent of the work was done by uh, Vijaya. She and uh, this is my lab, and these are my collaborators and funding. And thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, James. Wonderful talk. So I have a question that we received in the chat box. Sure. James, so yeah. <clears throat> the guy is telling that, sir, as you have mentioned here, that hyperconnection leads to more neuronal connections and hypoconnection leads to less neuronal connection. So my question is that the children who are less socially connected leads to less intellectual than that to children have big, bigger social connectivity? Uh, so this is a good question. So, um, so what happens is it not necessarily, not necessarily uh, we can say that, that less one have less intellectual capability and more have better intellectual um, capabilities. It's just that the brain needs optimal number. If you have less or too much, that's going to disrupt how the brain processes the information. So it needs to have the right number. We can't have less or more. So, so it doesn't mean that less means let's say less intellectual, right? Uh, so, uh, so not necessarily high also means you have better capabilities. It has to be right number. So any other questions from the students? Yeah. Sir, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sir, uh, I have a question, sir, that uh, you will explain that you are using heterozygous mice for Syngap. So what will happen if we are using homozygous mice for Syngap? Right. So as I mentioned in the talk, the homozygous mice do not survive for more than a week maximum. Most of them die within two to three days after birth. So we really can't uh, use that mouse model to study autism because they will not be alive to do the experiments. But people have done in cell culture where they hope they have an overexpressed syn gap or completely knocked down syn gap with sequence of uh, homozygous mice. Then we see a um, huge increase in the number of amper receptors compared to the heterozygous mice. So, and also the homozygous mice studies have shown that it leads to upper activation of apoptosis signal. And that leads to the death of the mice within a few days after birth. So we really don't know what really happens because they don't survive. And, and also the most of the patients are heterozygous, have heterozygous mutations. So it's important to focus on heterozygous mutation and we don't have any patient who has homozygous mutation. So any other questions? So thanks, James. So the questions are over. So it was excellent to have you with us. So hopefully Thank next you. time you come personally to Nagpur Ahmedabad, it's an open invitation to you. Thank you so and, much, yes. Uh, so it was excellent talk. Thank you very much, James. And as well as Dr. Jackson, who might have left. So we really are very privileged to have both of you today in the first round of lecture series one. So hopefully we will see you in person in coming days. Thank you very much, James. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye.